Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Let's continue our discussion of the steel plant example by asking whether there can be a market in the good health of the plant's neighbors. A point to make right at the outset is that for some of the plant's neighbors, that is, most prominently for those who are already in an exchange relationship with the plant, the costs to good health can be compensated as part of another larger transaction. So, for example, suppose that the workers who work at the steel plant also are neighbors of the steel plant and live in the immediate vicinity so that when steel is produced, the workers who live in the area also breathe the smoke, inhale the crud, and suffer damage to their good health. But those people are already in a bargaining relationship with the steel plant, either individually or through their union. And thus, periodically, an opportunity arises for those individuals to transact business with the steel plant over compensation that the steel plant will pay for services that that individual will render. If I'm a worker in the plant, at that moment, I can negotiate with the plant and get them to pay not only the value of my lost labor, the ordinary input, the property right to which I sell to the plant, but at the same moment, I can ask the plant and negotiate a price for my good health. That is to say, at the same time that I'm paid a wage, I could also be paid a premium in which the plant accounts for the cost that my breathing the crud will inflict upon my own good health. So for those people, there is no external cost imposed by the crud, assuming that those people have been able to come to terms with the steel plant owners through um, some other form of negotiation. And if this is the case, the externality is internalized, as they say, and it's been internalized by the pay plant paying compensation, which here I've called retribution for the rights that it has taken at a level acceptable to the owners from whom those rights were taken. So that, here I'm introducing purposefully a word that we'll use again in the context of the criminal law. That word is retribution. It typically means that people pay for the harms that they have done. And so the plant pays retribution for the infliction it has performed on the good health of its plant's neighbors. And if it does so to the satisfaction of the previous owners of good health, then those rights to good health will be allocated efficiently and no externality relationship will exist. For these neighbors, exchange will determine who the highest valuing owner of each property right is, and exchange will direct those property rights to the highest valuing owner. But for all the other neighbors, there are three distinct sources of transactions cost. And I'll argue in this lecture that taken together, the existence of these three distinct sources of transactions cost frustrates the operation of markets in good health and makes it impossible for the original owners of good health, the plant's neighbors, to come to terms with the plant over an adequate compensation that would be paid to earn the consent of the plant's neighbors to surrender their property rights to good health to the steel plant. These three distinct sources of transactions cost are, first, the widespread incidence of cost imposition. Secondly, the fact that costs are individualized and differ from person to person. And third is a source I'll call involuntariness and explain in detail in just a few minutes. It's important to note that it's not the existence of any of these transactions costs in isolation but the existence of all three of these sources of transactions cost at once that pushes transactions costs high enough to create an insuperable barrier to exchange and good health. What we'll see is that almost every market is plagued by some transactions cost, and many markets are plagued by the particular sources of transactions cost that I've identified here. But most markets face these sources of transactions costs one at a time, 
But in this particular situation, in the transaction between the good health of the owners of good health and the steel plant, all three sources of transactions cost exist at the same time, and taken together, they will make it impossible for transactions between the plant and its neighbors to take place. Let's talk about the first of these sources of transactions cost, what I've called the widespread incidence of cost imposition. This means only that there are a lot of people breathing the smoke, perhaps tens or hundreds of thousands of people living in the area around the plant, each of whom breathes the plant's smoke, each of whom inhales the crud, and each of whom suffers some deleterious effects to their health. In order to produce an efficient allocation of all of those property rights to good health, the plant must transact with many neighbors, all of these neighbors, to determine the highest valuing owner of each neighbor's right to good health, and thus whether the plant's taking of all of the rights to produce steel will in fact pay for itself. What this means is that it's hard to find out just what the total value of the cost imposition by the plant will be, so that it will be difficult for the plant to know whether taking the good health is worth it in terms of the amount of revenue that the firm can bring in from the production of steel. That the plant must transact with many neighbors, that is, that the costs of producing steel are spread over a very large number of people, is not just true in the case of steel production regarding good health, it's true in many contexts. So indeed, the steel plant typically is a large operation in which tens of thousands of people are working at any one time, and presumably all of those people must be brought into a grand deal, as it were, so that the plant can operate effectively with all of those people doing their jobs and all of their activities coordinated with one another. Large numbers, that is, are often involved in complex production, but as the story of the ordinary inputs makes clear, production can go on because free trade can go on, free exchange can go on amongst all of those large numbers of people, despite the fact that the production process is complex and lots of them must offer their consent to the loss of whatever property rights they are contributing to the production process in which they are engaged. So sometimes the existence of large numbers and the widespread incidence of cost does not fatally impede exchange, as in the case of the ordinary inputs. But sometimes widespread incidence of cost does make it difficult to transact, as was the case in the Leroy Fiber case. And that's because in the Leroy Farber case, as in this case, that first source of transactions cost, widespread incidence, is joined with a second source of transactions cost, what I call individualized costs. As I've assumed, each neighbor values his or her right to good health differently. That is, if I lose 18 months off my life, I will place a different internal subjective value on that loss of good health than you would for a similar loss of 18 months from your life. That means that the two property rights, my property right to my 18 months of good health and your property right to your 18 months of good health are different. That is to say, they're not homogeneous. The plant takes a different amount of good health from each of us each of us values that good health differently, and so the rights are not the same. As a result, competition between sellers of good health cannot operate to drive the price of every right to the single competitive price that we spoke of before. Instead, every transaction is a bilateral monopoly, that is, where there's only one buyer and one seller in which each and every price for each and every transaction must be individually negotiated. That is, the plant must negotiate with the neighbors who are actually living around it. So if the plant knocks on the door of one of its neighbors and said, how much will you sell your good health to me for? And the individual says, I won't sell my good health for less than $3 million. The plant 
has no option to go to somebody else and buy their good health instead for some value less than $3 million because the goods are not homogeneous. The plant needs the good health of the particular neighbor who actually lives there, and so it has to deal with that individual. It can't throw that person out of his house and negotiate with another person who would come to live in the house and who might sell an equal amount of good health more cheaply than the first person is willing to sell for. And so, on the other side, the owners of the good health have the opportunity to sell their good health only to the steel plant. And if the steel plant offers a half a million dollars for their good health, and they'd like to get $750,000 for their good health, they have no alternative to the steel plant. So the steel plant must bargain with the neighbors that it has and not with any competing neighbors, and the neighbors must bargain with the steel plant that faces them and not with any other competing steel plants or other users of good health. This, too, non-homogeneity of goods is a situation that's common in the real world. If you want to buy a great painting, say the Mona Lisa, there's only one Mona Lisa, and it's owned by only one person or institution in the world. If you want to buy the Mona Lisa, you must buy the Mona Lisa from this person. Perhaps there's another painting that is a mild substitute for the Mona Lisa, but there is no painting that's a perfect substitute for the Mona Lisa, and if that's the painting that you want, then you'll have to negotiate with the person who owns it, and you won't be able to rely on the forces of competition to force that person to lower the price at which he or she is willing to sell the Mona Lisa to you. By the same token, many of us in our daily lives operate in circumstances where we are dealing with monopolists, the only people in the world who can sell us the particular good that we want. Any of us who has a, fav a favorite hairdresser or any of us who has a personal physician who's treated us for many years knows that although all hairdressers more or less produce the same output and although more, all doctors more or less produce the same output, your favorite hairdresser produces the particular haircuts that you like, and your personal physician knows your medical history and has dealt with the peculiarities of your system over a long period of time. As a result, this hairdresser and this doctor can provide services to you that are worth more to you than similar services that might be offered by another hairdresser or by another doctor. But even in such a case, free exchange might exist anyway because the numbers involved are small. Only one transaction has to take place to move the Mona Lisa from its current owner to a new owner. Only one transaction has to take place between me and my hairdresser or between me and my physician. But in the Leroy Fiber case, and in this case, the steel plant example, the numbers of people who have to be brought into a transaction and each of them offering a non-homogeneous good is a very, very large number. And so, when large numbers of people have to be brought into a transaction and each one of those people has to be negotiated with individually because each of those people is the only buyer or seller of the good in question, then the concurrent existence of these two conditions will in fact create a formidable transactions cost barrier to exchange. But there's a third overwhelmingly important source of transactions cost in this example, which taken together with the other two sources of transactions cost will surely frustrate the operation of free exchange between the steel plant and its neighbors. And I call this third source of transactions cost involuntariness. Involuntariness exists in two senses. The first sense is that people may, at one moment in time, agree to take a risk in exchange for a particular sum of money. 
If they do so, and the risk doesn't come to pass, then they've been paid for taking the risk, even though they haven't suffered as a result of that, because the risky situation has not come to pass. But if this happens, the people who have been paid for taking the risk get their payment anyway. They've taken the risk, and in this hypothetical situation, they've lucked out. The risk has not come to fruition, but the taker of the risk gets the compensation anyway. But risks are risks, and sometimes they do come true. And so, if I contract to take a risk, and I am paid to take the risk, and then the risky situation becomes a reality, and I'm about to be killed or hurt badly, I may, in the instant between the moment when I realize that the risk is going to come to pass and when the cost is actually suffered, I may say, dang, I wish I had not agreed to take this particular risk, and if I had to do it all over again, I might not do it. A good example of such a situation is provided by the Great Walenda. The Great Walenda was a wire walker who came from a family of high wire artists who performed in circuses all across Europe during the 19th and the 20th centuries. Long ago, in 1972, when I was a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia Phillies, who played baseball in the city of Philadelphia, were suffering through a very, very unhappy, dismal baseball season in which they lost a very, very large proportion of their games. As a result, attendance at the games flagged, and the management of the Phillies decided to offer an attraction to bring more people into the stadium. And so, one day in August, they hired the great Walenda, Carl Walenda, the patriarch of the Walenda high wire walking family, to walk on a wire that was strung across the top of the veteran stadium in Philadelphia where the Phillies played baseball. And here's a picture of the great Walenda himself walking on a wire 150 feet above the hard surface of the veteran stadium and as you can see in the picture, he does not have a net. It took him about 12 minutes to walk across the wire. People looked up from the stadium in awe as he walked by. It being Philadelphia, it was said half the crowd was rooting for him to fall off the wire, but he didn't fall off the wire. He made it to the end. And he was paid $3,000 by the Philadelphia Phillies to walk on that wire across the stadium uh, from rooftop to rooftop. He didn't fall off the wire. He didn't die. He wasn't injured. And it took him 12 minutes to walk across the wire. And he was paid $3,000, a pretty nice wage rate. But obviously, a large part of that $3,000 was compensation to Mr. Walenda for taking the colossal risk that he took walking across that wire so high above the hard floor of the stadium. Imagine, however, what might have gone through his mind had he unfortunately fallen off the high wire down toward the floor of the stadium. In the two or three seconds it might have taken for him to hit the ground, the thought might have passed through his mind, maybe I shouldn't have taken the $3,000, maybe this was not such a good deal at all. And in such a case, we might say that Walenda's death was involuntary, because at the moment that he was dying, he would say to himself, I wish I had not made the choice to do this, if I had it to do all over again, I would never do such a thing. Interestingly, as you'll notice, Wallenda died in 1978 in Belgium, not surprisingly and unfortunately, after falling off a high wire. But there's a second sense in which involuntariness may occur, and this is the one that overwhelmingly produces the failure of markets in situations like the steel plant example. And that is, for technical reasons, that is, because of the circumstances of the case, 
the cost imposer may simply be able to impose the cost in circumstances where the owner just cannot stop the imposition before it happens or extract compensation for the cost. This is always the case in accidents. Nobody volunteers to be the victim of an accident, and if an accident is a true accident, even the causer of the accident doesn't volunteer to cause the accident. It just happens. And if somebody has a property right to be free of the costs of somebody else's carelessness that produces an accident, then when that accident happens, the person who holds that property right will lose it because of the accident. There's nothing that that individual could have done to stop the accident and therefore to stop the taking of his, in, of his property right to be free of the costs of accidents. It's inherent in the situation that there can't really be any negotiation over terms of trade between the person who is going to cause the accident and the person who is going to be the victim of the accident. And so, if the cost imposer is able to impose the cost without the owner's consent in such a way that the owner can't stop the imposition of the cost or extract comp compensation for the cost on the spot, if that is the case, then there will be an insuperable barrier to exchange between the cost imposer and the cost bearer unless the cost imposer, for his or her own reason, decides not to impose the cost. And in this case, markets in good health will fail. Indeed, they'll not only fail to move property rights to their highest valuing owner, they will fail to exist at all. They won't just not work perfectly, they won't work at all. And if so, the costs of CRUD will remain uncompensated and too much steel will be produced because a crucial input to the production of steel, the good health of the plant's neighbors, will have been taken from them without their consent and without payment of compensation to them, that is, will have been stolen from them rather than purchased from them in the way that all ordinary inputs are purchased. In the next lecture, we'll talk about a series of potential solutions to this problem of market failure.